Let's look at the proposed transition from the presidential uh, to parliamentary system of government in Nigeria, uh, a bill sponsored by minority leader Rep. Kingsley Chinda and a group of lawmakers from different political parties and regions in Nigeria who believe that the current presidential system the country runs is too expensive, it's inefficient and divisive. They argue that a parliamentary system will foster one, a more cooperation, more representation, um, and accountability amongst the political actors in the country and ultimately lead to a better governance and development outcomes for Nigeria, which is Africa's largest democracy. Well, uh, we want to find out, is this really the case, the things that they're saying? Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each system and how would such a change affect um, the balance of power, how will it affect the electoral process in Nigeria, and how will it affect the constitutional framework uh, of the country? To help us answer these and other questions, we have joining us via video link, Mutala Dogi Mohammed. He's the founder and chief executive officer of System Strategy and Policy Lab Abuja. Omoshala uh, Deji is a political scientist. He, jo he joins us from Lagos, uh, while Mohammed joins us from Abuja. Gentlemen, very good evening to you. Thank you so very kindly for your time tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good evening. Um, I'm glad to be here. Thank Listening you very much. Indeed, Nigeria uh, adopted the parliamentary system of government in 1954 when it became a federation. Uh, we had a north and west and an eastern region, each with its own regional legislature and government. Now, this was part of the process of gradual self-government and independence from British colonial rule. Uh, the Nigerian parliamentary system was based on the Westminster model of the United Kingdom, which was a former colonial power uh, of the country. The head of state at the time was the Queen of England, represented by the Governor General, while the head of the government of Nigeria was the Prime Minister, who was the leader of the majority party or the coalition party in the country at the time. And the Prime Minister uh, appointed and presided over a cabinet of ministers who were also members of the parliament. Um, of course, the Nigerian parliament at the time was bicameral, but our guests and I will tell us more. And I'll start with you, uh, uh, Dr. Omoshala Deji. Um, you're a political scientist. What is the, uh, give us a, a deeper understanding of the history of um, parliamentary governance in Nigeria, beyond what I've just talked about, please. Well, Nigeria practiced the um, parliamentary system of government, as you rightly said, but since the return to, to them, democracy in 1999, we practiced the presidential system of government. And the presidential system of government dictates that the president is the um, head of the executive. There are three arms of government the, um, in a constitutional democracy, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. For the uh, um, presidential system of government, the president is elected by the people, the executive, is an independent arm of government, just as we have in Nigeria today. And the executive is being checkmated by the legislature and, of course, the judiciary when the needs arises. But in a parliamentary system of government, the head of state, the, the, the head of government is also a member of the legislative arm of government. In other words, if we practice a parliamentary system of government, the president now, President Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, will be representing his constituency in Lagos State. He will be elected into the parliament as a legislature. Then after the election, the legislature will now sit down amongst themselves to elect a prime minister. What yes. that means is, is that the legislative arm of government is fused together with the executive. Now that the president has um, a secured tenor and can not so much be um, twisted by the legislature, if he is a member of the legislature, he can easily be removed with a vote of no confidence. So I think for, for us to have a secured tenor, that is why um, the framers of the 1999 Constitution insisted that we should have a presidential democracy, whereby the president 
will be different from the who, who have no 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 form of alliance with the legislature all right quite interesting um uh, for you yeah. uh, mohammed what would you say um uh, are the benefits of changing the nigerian you know uh system from presidential um to a parliamentary system uh we've heard what the house of reps members have said but what do you think are the benefits of the system and are you for it the, um, yes, I like the um, the last question, whether am I for it or not. Um, I think basically um, I am not for it because uh, we strongly believe any issue that the parliament will come for the change of the form of government we are practicing should be evidence-based. What I mean by evidence-based is that in the development space, we love um, to engage with data um, with evidence of what is working and what is not working. So before they come up with this bill of changing from the uh, presidential system that we are practicing now to the um, elementary system and to the uh, parliamentary system, I think basically we need evidence of why did they come up with the conclusion that we need a change of form of government. When they talk of the cost of governance, how much are we spending in the presidential system that will be able to cut the cost to spend in the parliamentary system. What is the cost like? And compare some country, either in Asia or in other parts of the world or in Africa that practice parliamentary system, um, what is the cost compared to Nigeria that is practice presidential system? So um, to me, this is like a diversion of matter at stake. At the moment, Nigeria is passing through a very difficult moment, a moment in the development space we call stagflation. Stagflation is where the inflation rate is high, the poverty is high, unemployment rate is high. Then they are now bringing the issue of changing the form of government. This is not what uh, we need at the moment. What Nigeria needs at the moment is the team of people that will come together and solve the problems that is affecting Nigerians. Governance is about solving the problem. So to me, although they have a time frame, their plan is to begin the process now and they'll end it by 2031. That is when Tinibu will finish his eight years, if in case he gets re-elected after the four years. But the biggest challenge in Nigeria is personal is the challenge of poverty, unemployment, hunger, insecurity. So the parliament uh, three members should focus on addressing this challenge now. Maybe towards the end of their tenure, they can begin to talk about having a change of form of government. But to me, there is this proverb that said, pot where they leak for Lagos. If you carry the pot, go Abuja, that pot will still leak. So it means, I don't see, it, it, it might not be about the form of government. It might be about the structure, the system that we put together to design this country. So even when we change to the parliamentary system, what will change? Are we going to get people from other countries to come and solve our problem? Okay, so Mohammed, let, let me put the same question to you. Raise some interesting points. Let me put the same question to uh, Deja Moshala. Um, I, I, do you think this is what Nigeria needs at this time? Because Mohammed is saying that uh, it's not the time for such arguments, except, of course, the uh, parliamentarians and the representatives can provide data to show why Nigeria needs this at this time. And he cited um, uh, the economic uh, and security problems Nigeria is facing at the moment. Moshala Deji. Well, um, Nigeria's problem is multifaceted, so um, the problems must be tackled holistically. I think we shouldn't tackle the um, economic front and forget the um, the political front, because if you look at our dwindling resources at the moment, if we have a system of government that's going to save us cost, I think it is better that we embrace it. So if we have a parliamentary system and we have a um, unicameral legislature, which is one legislative house, you know, which will either be called House of Representatives or Senate, you know, I think it would be better. But what I have, um, what I'm concerned about is the timing. You see, we play too much politics with everything in this country. If you sit down and you think that the parliamentary system of government is good for Nigeria at this time. Why wait till like the next seven years? You know, why oh, not? No. Okay, um, Max, 2027, the next election cycle, 
Why wait to 20? Well, well that, but that is probably because it, th there is already a current administration that has just come in. There is and an it is, administration. It is going to take a lot of, it's going to be very distracting because Tinubu is going to be on uh, from 2023 to 2020, what? 2020. Uh, uh, four, five, well, I, six, seven. I, I disagree. I disagree. The reason, and then, the if he wins the second term, it's going to take another four years to 2031. So, maybe, maybe constitutionally, it's, yeah, constitutionally, yeah. Tinumbu's tenure doesn't end in 2021 at the end, in 2031 at the moment. He ends in 2027. Tinumbu's tenure ends in 2027. So, if the parliamentary system is good enough for Nigeria, why 2031? You know, and this thing happened during um, Jonathan's era as well. So, so DJ, Omosh, DJ, Omosh, Omosh, let me ask you, Omosh, um, you know, they just complain about it, every, everything. If they did it, said, let's start it this year. We'll say it's too soon. How soon do you think that the House of Rest members, led by Minority Leader, Representative Kingsley Chinda of Obiapo Federal Constituency, how soon do you think they should have started or they should have said as a beginning of such a policy? Well, I will follow the dictates of the Constitution. Constitutionally, right now, the tenure cannot be changed because they've been elected under a um, Constitution, and the various sections of the Constitution dictate that once you are elected, you are going to spend four years. But after that four years, there's going to be another democratic transition. So why, you know, in your widest dream, you know, think that okay, we should make it twenty um thirty one. What if so, the so give, so, so what what, what year are you giving? Election? Are you saying twenty twenty seven? Maybe twenty 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 seven is the um, accurate time if the House of Representatives are indeed serious and if they have the interest of Nigeria truly at heart. It should be twenty twenty seven where their current tenure is going to expire, not twenty. 31. You don't know what will happen in 2027. So if the proposed legislation is so good enough, it should be implemented in 2027. This is 2024. We have three years to be able to strategize. But for you to now, because of one man who happens to be the president, to now think that something that is good for Nigeria shouldn't happen just because of one man is not right. Just like we have during the case of President Jonathan, where he asserted that we should practice six years single term, which is quite good because if you look at it, if the, the, the governors and presidents are elected for four years, like six months to one year, you know, is being spent in the court. The court sits over the election. So technically, they have like two years to govern because a year before the election, they are already strategizing for another election. So if we have six years single term, it is beneficial to the system. But this same politics evolved at that time, and something as good as that that would have benefited the system was, in, was eventually, you know, not implemented. So I support that, okay, the um, parliamentary system of government would be a cost-saving method. Though it has this demerit that the legislature is going to become more powerful. And if the kind of um, personalities that we have in the legislature now is anything to go by, whereby, you know, um, they are sending prayers to mailbox and the kind of bills they are passing and all that, is there anything to go by? Whether the parliamentary system will eventually save costs is a different ball game mentality because that cost that should have been saved for election could eventually end up into the pocket of the parliamentarians because right. why? The prime minister will be part of them. Okay. And all right, did you, we, we, we have more time to that, David. But, but, so are you, are you, saying, no you, are you saying you, uh, you think this is a brilliant idea? Is that what you're saying? Say that again. Are you, are you in support of the idea? Well, um, I am in support of the idea if it is going to be properly implemented. And I can only give the idea my support if it's going to be implemented in 2027, not 2031. All right. All right. Uh, I, I want to come back to you, uh, Mohammed. What do you think, um, since you, 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 you're still a bit pessimistic about this, what do you think are the downsides of, um, um, let's leave the evidence for now, from what you, your observation of Nigeria politics, Nigeria as a nation, what do you think are the disadvantages or the downsides of having such a system? Mohamed. Let me, let me, the downside of the parliamentary system, let me build on what 
my colleague George said now. Um, the competency, the capacity, and the character of people were elected into parliaments. Um, it's something to worry about if we continue this way. Because even the team of ministers that we're going to have might be likely from the parliament. And, and if you look at them, it means the chance of having some experts from other parts of the world, like when we had Ngozi Okonjo Wela, um, uh, Obia Gile um, the big technocrats, additional that is in the African Development Bank now, the chance of getting those people might be a little bit difficult because they are not in the parliament. So this is another downside of this system because the prime minister will be from them, the ministers might likely come from them, and the quality of people we are electing into the system is, the, is just the biggest problem we have. We have people in a position of power that may uh, uh, be elected as a parliament member, they automatically become ministers that will not, they, they will not be able to solve our problems. And like I said earlier, governance is about solving the problem. So that is why I'm not with the system of parliamentary at this moment, because it might restrict us to getting ministers basically from the parliament, because the prime minister is from them. And well, well, you, say, you so, save money, you save money. I mean, if, for instance, um, you have one parliament, uh, you pick a, a minister, maybe representative Oke Chinda, uh, you pick him from there, you make him the minister yes. of um, uh, petroleum resources, for instance, since it's from uh, all producing but state. Do you know? Do you, 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 do don't, you don't have to pay him two salaries. You pay him only one salary. You pay him the salary of uh, a parliamentarian, and that's it. The Nigerian you don't version might be different. The, yeah. the Nigerian version might be different. They might say the person will collect two salaries. No, you can't. You, you can't. Even salary, the constitution does not allow it. Yeah, I don't think you collect two salaries. You collect one. Except, okay, except the constitution does not allow it in mm. such a way. But if not, I'm afraid, you know, we discuss more politics, more about politics than governance in Nigeria. We have problems to solve. And like what he said, if we continue this way, it means we're going to put in so many resources to having a lot of regional consultative dialogue, regional forum, regional workshop between now to in the next eight years, till 2031. So there are so many downsides we left to me because of, in terms of saving cost of governance, we might likely save the cost of governance because we get the minister from the parliament, fine. But what is the quality of the people that we're going to have? Well, well, if you're talking about, if you're talking about quality, Mohammed, if you're talking about quality, these are the people who make laws for you. Every day. Absolutely. We, I, 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 they I represent you. But, 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 but now you can even see what are the impacts of the laws that they make? What are the impacts so far? Well, well, well some of them are, are those who are now ministers. Some of them left to go become ministers. Yes, they left. They become ministers. So ministers are from but, them, yeah. But, yeah. Yes. Uh, but even your even your president, yeah. your current president, was a senator. I, I, yes, but if you see, I am um, I am worried because the recruitment process of getting our leaders from the president down to the senators to the governors, it's not uh, designed in such a way that competency, leadership, degree, experience counts. No matter where you come from, if you have no experience, no leadership quality, you can become a senator and automatically you become a minister. Then you assign a minister of agri and you are to address the issue of food security and climate change. Maybe. Well, 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 well uh, 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 Mohammed, how, how have the how have the ministers fared so far? I mean, look at the results. Look at the products we've we'll seen. You know, some people are there. You know, I don't know if it's because of um, how they campaign for the president. Some people are there because they are party men. We see a lot of party men and women being made ministers in this administration, and some people from other administrations as well. You know, we have talked about nepotism in regional balance, ethnic balance, mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, have the have the ministers in recent years who are not parliamentarians or uh, legislators have they have they covered themselves in any distinguished glory? Yes, some of them, some of them to some extent, like the minister of health. Um, uh, Professor Ali Party has not been in parliament and has been a technocrat. Wale is in the Minister of Finance, being from the World Bank, you know. So we have some few of them. Uh, the Minister of Digital Economy is from the private sector. Social enterprise is doing well. No, 
you know. So we have a good number of them that are doing well, but the majority of them are not doing well because they are still struggling to understand what they are there for. Because of the leadership pedigree, because of the level of the competency, the level of experience, where we are bringing them. We have ministers that up to now, they don't, don't even have a strategic plan of what they want to achieve in the next four years. And first thing first, so I'm worried because by the time we move completely to the parliamentary system, election in this part of the world is people that have a lot of money to spend. So no matter your leadership, your degree, no matter your competency, if you have money to spend, you will spend money, you become a parliament, you become a minister automatically, and we still remain where we are. All right, all right. Um, uh, Murtala Mohammed and uh, Deji Omoshal, I will be right back. And for those of you listening, we'll have some more uh, conversation on this. When we come back after this break. Welcome back. We're still talking uh, the move by 60, at least 60 members of Nigeria's uh, lower house, legislative house, at least, at the House of Representatives to uh, move for a change in the Nigerian system of government, uh, which is currently a presidential system. They want to see transition to a parliamentary system. Um, 60 members of the House of Representatives from differing political backgrounds led by Minority Leader Representative uh, Kingsley Chinda, uh, who represents the good people of Obiapo federal constituency, have placed the bill before the House of Representatives, seeking to transition Nigeria to a parliamentary system. And of course, we said Nigeria had this parliamentary system uh, in 1954, um, of course, just before the country gained independence. And uh, Nigeria adopted that system uh, when it became a federation of three regions. You had uh, the northern region, you had the western region, and of course you had the eastern region, each with its own regional um, government. So that's what you had at the time. Of course, this was part of the process of uh, Nigeria's gradual move to uh, self-government and independence from the British colonial rule. Now, the parliamentary system Nigeria ran at the time was based on the Westminster model of the United Kingdom, which was uh, Nigeria's colonial power. Um, of course, the head of state was the Queen of England, uh, represented by Governor General, Nigeria being a colony at the time. Well, the head of the government of Nigeria was um, the Prime Minister, who uh, was the leader of the majority party or coalition of, a, uh, uh, of the ruling part of the parties that formed the coalition then in the House of Representatives at the time. Uh, the Prime Minister was appointed uh, and presided over a cabinet of ministers who were also members of the Parliament. Now, interesting to know that the Nigerian Parliament at the time was a bicameral one, uh, consisting of a House of Representatives and a Senate. The House of Representatives had 184 members uh, who were elected by universal um, uh, adult suffrage, while the Senate had uh, 44 members, 12 from each region, and then eight appointed by the governor general. Uh, so that's what happened. The parliament, apart from making laws, also oversaw the executive and then represented the interest of the people. Nigeria's first prime minister uh, in that system, of course, was uh, the legendary Sir Abubakar Tafaraba Lewa. Uh, he led a coalition government. So there was not, it wasn't a majority government, but a coalition government of the NPC, at the time, the Northern People's Congress and then the NCNC at the time, the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroon. So they came together to form a coalition in order to have a majority at the parliament. Now, he was succeeded by Sir Madubello, uh, who led the same coalition from 1966, of course. Um, who, he was the leader of that coalition. Well, let's, um, let's uh, go back to our guests, because the parliamentary system at that time was meant to accommodate the ethnic makeup uh, of Nigeria, uh, the ethnic divisions of Nigeria. Of course, Nigeria is largely seen as a division between the north, the southwest, and the southeast. Um, of course, at the time, the north, you had the Sadano of Sokoto and uh, Amadu Bello uh, and the Tafawa Balewa, sorry. You had uh, Namdi Azikwe from the southwest, southeast, sorry. And of course, Obafemi Awolo from the southwest. Let's go back to a guest. Um, 
DJ Boshala, um, let's look at the balance of uh, the regional um, power in Nigeria. Um, looking at the call and the clamor for restructuring in the country, um, do you see this as a, a pathway to restructuring Nigeria based on the ethnic and regional uh, divisions that the country has? Yes, it is surely a pathway to restructuring because um, when you restructure, that means you're trying to change the, um, the old order to try something new. So moving away from the presidential to parliamentary system is definitely part of restructuring. But on the ethnic front, there is something that we Nigerians have to take cognizance of which is if you want to practice parliamentary system of government, we should practice it the right way in such a way that there's going to be equity among the six geopolitical zones of Nigeria. Currently, the Southeast comprises of five states. Now, if we practice a parliamentary system of government and the legislatures are elected into the parliament, and the legislators now have to appoint, uh, have to elect the prime minister amongst themselves. That means that the northern part of the country, you know, is more as currently has more advantage than the south because the northern states, you, you know, and they have six, six the, the northern regions have sixty states, but in the south, and if you kind of like you know um, narrow it down to the southeast, it has five. State. So, in other words, the legislature that will be emerging from the South will be lesser than that of the North. So, if any decision is to be taken, the North can easily use that numerical advantage to dictate who the Prime Minister will be and that will continue. So, the South must be careful not to fall into that trap. Before the parliamentary system is introduced, if they will allow it to sail through, the South East must first of all have and one more state to make it six, so that the legislature that will be coming from the south will equate that that will be coming from the north, so that we have a balanced system. So when we have that, then it will not be easy for one region to muzzle the other. The advantage of the presidential system now is that the president is being elected by the people across the country. And there have been an uh, advocate that passed. Maybe we should even have um, something like an electoral college that is being done in the United States. But with what we have now, majority vote, now we are still managing that at the moment. But if we introduce parliamentary system without addressing the, the inequality in the um, representative that is coming out from right. each, each geopolitical zone, especially, right. the South, especially the South East, especially the South East, it would not be of advantage to the South because the North will use their power to be to be right. who the Prime Minister will be. And okay, if the, 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 the let's Constitution give does Muhammad not state, a, sorry, a just a moment. To if the Constitution saying. does not state, uh, or maybe does not zone that okay, after four years it should it, it should be rotational. The, the power should be rotational. Then what we will have when we practice the parliamentary system is that a Northerner will just keep imagining as the Prime Minister... Okay, did, did you the hold the thought. Let, let's allow Mutala Mohammed tell us. If, what do you think about that's interesting a point that uh, uh, DJ Moshala has, has made? Mutala. Okay, well, Mutala, it seems we're yeah. having difficult, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, difficulty yeah. hearing. DJ is making a very valid point. He's making a very important point. Um, uh, because one of the agitation of the Southeastern people is the issue around the the re marginalization because they have only five states compared to other parts of Nigeria where they have six states. And if you go with the parliamentary system, uh, basically Northern Nigeria will have the majority of members of the parliament. Um, if you look at Kano State, for instance, with four, four local government, they have 22 members of House of Representatives representing the Kano. Then okay. compared to um, um, a state in Southeast, or maybe okay. a Bayelsa with only eight local government. So, so basically, you, you, you have the same Bayelsa. view with um, uh, Oboshala that this may be an issue. Uh, we have to stop at that. Gentlemen, thank you so very kindly for your time. Indeed, you've all both raised 
interesting aspects of this conversation that will lead to more conversation, I'm sure, uh, uh, for the time. Mutala Dogi Mohammed, founder and CEO of Systems Strategy and Policy Lab. Thank you very much for your time. Of course, uh, uh, DJ Moshala, political scientist. It's been a great uh, time with both of you, and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thanks, Alvin. We'll be right back. Uh, when we return, we speak with Omoile Shore. Back, our guest tonight is a man who needs no introduction. He is Omoile Shore, the founder of Sahara Reporters, uh, convener of Revolution Now, and uh, former presidential candidate of the African Action Congress. He was arrested uh, by DSS operatives at midnight on August 3, 2019, two days before a planned Revolution Now protest he convened, tagged Days of Rage. <laughs> Maybe that's what got him arrested. And he was charged with treason. Also, at another time, he was charged with cyber-stalking and money laundering uh, for allegedly planning to overthrow the government. Today, Nigeria's federal government has uh, released a statement uh, saying that they are discontinuing uh, his trial uh, at the Federal High Court in Abuja. Um, of course, that's signed by Latif Fagbemi, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Omoyele um, Shore, good evening to you. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, do you um, now consider yourself a free man? I know I'm asking that question. Uh, no, I, uh, my freedom wasn't tied at any time to the charges. I knew that the charges were fake, they were concocted. And they were meant to silence me. So I'd always operated as a free man, even though they cordoned uh, my life and ensured that uh, I couldn't travel out of Abuja for three years and uh, kept me in Nigeria in the last five, you know, four years plus now. Uh, but I never thought myself uh, as being inhibited in any way. And philosophically, I cannot consider myself a free man until uh, we're able to free up the space for development, progress, and uh, democracy in this country. All right. So you, you consider yourself free, but not free in another context. Um, how do you feel about the decision of uh, Tinubu-led federal government to drop the charges against you or discontinue the case, as they said? Um, do you think they, they just uh, you know, believe that you are innocent? Do you have any good words for uh, President Bola Tinubu? No, I think I deserve an apology from him and uh, his political party uh, for the harm that was done to me, uh, done to members of my family, my children, my business, uh, for standing up for my rights. Things that even Tinubu himself did when he was a senator in this country during the pro-democracy era. Uh, when he was at turn, they were very mean, very disrespectful and dangerously uh, almost uh, destroyed my life, uh, including, you know, uh, assassinating my brother. My mother is down with a stroke in the last four years. I haven't seen my children in the last four and a half years and my wife. And they constantly harass me, harang me. They attacked me. You see, it's, you see uh, a scar on my face. The police officer broke my nose. In 2021, another police officer shot at me at close range with a riot gun, uh, hoping to uh, destroy me. So all this were done to me. They also would hire thugs to come and attack me physically in court. I was abducted, kidnapped in front of a judge. I deserve not just an apology, I, I deserve serious compensation for what was done to me. And I intend to take up uh, this seriously against them to ensure that they are prosecuted or uh, made to pay for the malicious uh, uh, prosecution and persecution that I faced. Okay. And I intend to do it in, in multiple jurisdictions in case they get away with it here. I'm sure they can't get it away with it elsewhere. And I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to do this against some individuals like the former Attorney General Malami, uh, former President uh, Buhari, all of them that cooked up the, this crime against humanity. They will never get away with it, uh, oh. no matter how long it takes. Uh, do you see this as a victory for justice, or do you see this as merely, you know, a political move by by the administration? I was in court yesterday arguing with the judge to <laughs> to strike out the case. It was uh, the 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 legal part of it was a sham, and I must uh, give kudos to my lawyer Femi Falano, who from the beginning of this case made it very clear that they can't get away with this and he will get me out 
uh, on the time Professor Wale Shoyinka, who came physically to court uh, to be there. And he sent me a message as soon as he saw this, that he knew this wasn't going to go anywhere. He was uh, he thought this was ridiculous that anybody even did this uh, to me. Uh, but they've all faced these type of things before. You know, I want to thank uh, my wife and kids, my family members, uh, two of my brothers who are lawyers who uh, worked very hard to ensure that this case was defeated in court. But at the end of the day, it was a disgrace to the legal system. I mean, you can imagine a judge allowing DSS to come abduct somebody in her court, and next time she behaved as if nothing happened. And uh, imagine, you know, how they couldn't present any witness except one who testified now in, in my in, in, in my uh, in, in, in support of uh, my rights. There were judgments, you know, uh, given over the seizure of my phone. The lawless DSS refused to release my phone, even after judgments were given. Another judge in Abuja said what he did to me was wrong. They just didn't care. It was a political party that thrives in impunity. And that's why, you know, I take exception to anybody saying I should thank Tinubu for this. No, they should thank me for remaining, uh, you know, very law abiding, despite all what they did to me. All oh, right. Um, uh, I don't know who said it, but anyway. Um, so, so uh, we know that you were you were abducted or you were arrested at midnight in uh, 2019. Your house was raided. We all saw the videos, the CCTV footage, and all that. How they broke into your house and whisked you away. And then uh, after your incarceration, when you were taken to court, the judge set you free, and the DSS tried to rearrest you. In the court premises, and this is footage of when they, they broke didn't into. They didn't try to rearrest me. They abducted me within the court premises. Within the, they brought out their guns and all that within the court premises, then dragged you. Uh, remember, your lawyers tried to shield you. So these are these are images, or uh, this footage from when they broke into your house. Um, I want us to talk about the DSS for a moment. What are your thoughts on this organization? I mean, personally, I've been I've been arrested by the DSS because someone wrote a petition over me or for something they heard on radio. And I was surprised that uh, what I thought was secret police, you know, CIA of Nigeria, uh, was, was um, settling a squabble over a petition about what I said on radio, you know, which was not what I expected such an agency to do. And I want to point to um, what Peter Funaya, or what the DSS through Peter Funaya said in 2019 when he faced uh, the press. They said that um, you were arrested for threatening public safety uh, and peaceful coexistence and social harmony in the country, pointing out that the did agency they pointed out that they were they were charged with the responsibility of managing, curtailing, containing, and eliminating threats against national security. Peter Fonoy also said that these threats include sabotage, uh, threats of subversion, threats of terrorism, and uh, ethnic agitation, separatist ag agitations, economic sabotage, and others. Uh, it says if quote if we are operating as a responsible security organization and someone is calling for a revolution in Nigeria, we must understand the meaning of revolution. It means revolt, insurrection, insurgency. It means forceful takeover of government. And we're operating a democratic system in Nigeria. Uh, he said, quote, Nigeria is not a banana republic and cannot suddenly be made one. What are your thoughts on, on the operations uh, of the DSS, Do, using your situation, your case as a, as a case study? Summary of it is that Nigeria... It's a banana republic. Everything they did to me in this case and they've done to you, they've done to citizens, is what you get from a banana republic, abducting people in the middle of the night, lying against them, uh, and presenting false evidence before judges to detain people for a prolonged period of time. And I must say this, and I'm uh, very ashamed of uh, Justice, Justice, uh, Justice Taiwo Taiwo, who allowed them to detain me with false information without even asking or trying to do some inquiry to be sure that I did a lie to me that I went to collect $100 million from Dubai. Turns out I've never been to Dubai before. <laughs> you understand? The judge just threw the keys at me, kept me in detention for 45 days. When that was done, uh, when he refused to renew it because it had become an embarrassment, he, you know, even I, attempts by lawyers to even get into review, he refused. He was just playing games. Now he's retired and he's living in Nigeria mm -hmm that they have all created and are safe, no, right. you know, a all terrible... Right. Oh, but Alicia, I'm so history. sorry to inter interject, but we I have to go... Nigeria yeah. is a banana republic. This yeah. is a banana republic. This all doesn't right. get um, worse than that.
Thank, thank you very much for your time. I, I don't know if your passport has been returned to you yet. Just quickly, has it been returned to you? They haven't returned my passport to me. They haven't returned my phones to me. They have not reopened my bank accounts that were closed illegally. And like I said, I'm going to take legal steps. All right. You've not, you've not you've not seen your family for how many years now? I haven't seen them since July of 2019. Okay. And this is funny. by the way, tomorrow is my birthday, so you can take that as a gift. All right. Uh, but you know, it's not over because right. the struggle has just commenced until we are liberated completely. Right. So as so, as it stands, you can't even travel to go spend your birthday with your family. Revolution time, revolution now. All right. Um, well, sure, thank you so very kindly for your time. We will talk some more about this in the coming days and weeks, surely. And that's the size of our package right here, Politics HQ. It's been quite interesting this week. And, of course, we'll return on Monday with more conversations on the latest in Nigerian politics. My name is Kofi Bartels tonight.